Uh, today I'm going to be reviewing uh, Tyler's paper on interpreting TAFL behavior of consecutive uh, electrochemical reactions through combined thermodynamic and steady state microkinetic approaches. Um, this is, you know, I, I basically went through the list of potential papers and I picked the subgroup that I understood the least. Um, so I hope that doesn't show too badly, um, but here goes. Um, first though, I wanna make a brief personal announcement. So um, Denise, my girlfriend and I, <laughs> um, uh, after dating for, for five years, we finally decided to uh, get a second cat. Ooh. <laughs> and also we got married. <laughs> Yay! Uh, a so a couple weeks ago. <laughs> uh, so a couple weeks ago, we flew back to Pennsylvania and uh, you know, uh, had, a, had a wedding in my family's private property out there. Um, that's where we're from is Pennsylvania. So, so you um, don't get to call her your girlfriend anymore, Justin. That's, well, <laughs> it's for the joke. Come on. It's, it's, it's my, this is my beautiful wife, Denise. Uh, <laughs> so um, yeah, so that, that was a good time. Just thought I'd, I'd share that with everyone. Um, but onto the, onto the science. So the topic today is uh, water electrolysis for, for clean energy. So we can, um, we can write out this reaction in which we split water into uh, O2 and H2. So we take a very cheap common resource and turn it into a, a, a very clean fuel, uh, hydrogen. And if you wanna do this via electrolysis, you can split it into two separate half reactions. Uh, the hydrogen evolution reaction, the first one, and the oxygen evolution reaction, which is the, the second one. And um, you'll notice that per uh, hydrogen molecule, you get, uh, it takes two electron transfers in the hydrogen evolution reaction. And per oxygen molecule, it'll take four electron transfers in the um, oxygen evolution reaction. And as a result, there's um, the hydrogen production is, is limited by the sluggish kinetics of the oxygen evolution reaction. And <clears throat> um, this is largely because uh, you can split this reaction into um, four single uh, one electron transfers. Uh, I've outlined one of the schemes here, which is the scheme that Tyler uses in, uh, in the paper. Um, and you'll notice these stars and the stars uh, are indicative of uh, adsorbed species. So the star without any species attached to it is just an empty surface site. Um, and then if there is a uh, molecule attached to it, that, is, that means that that site is adsorbed to the surface of, of the electron. And more background, uh, really briefly, we'll talk about uh, electrokinetics and electrode kinetics and TAFL plots. Uh, so if you wanted to plot the current as a function of the applied voltage in, in uh, this electrode splitting, in this, uh, uh, excuse me, water splitting reaction. Uh, you can model it using um, the butler volmer equation, which we sh many of us are familiar with. And you'll notice that the curve is split into uh, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. The left is the red and the uh, right is the blue. And the uh, right side is you know, the anodic side and the uh, left side is the cathodic side. And in the butler volmer equation, there's two terms, uh, the anodic and the cathodic, and you'll notice that at high overpotentials, so overpotential is very far from, um, from zero, uh, one of those two currents is going to dominate. Um, so in this case, if you go to high overpotential, you'll see that the uh, anodic part of the curve will dominate, and you can express the total current uh, as approximately equal to just this anodic current. Uh, which pairs very nicely with these uh, TAFL plots, which I believe precede uh, the butler volmer equation by a good bit. Um, but now with the uh, you know, further informed understanding of um, electrode kinetics, you can start to make, uh, make better sense of this. So if you plot the uh, over potential versus the log of the current, um, then uh, at high over potentials, you'll start to get these, these straight lines. And this, this plot is very useful for, for a number of reasons. Um, the first reason is that uh, at one of the intercepts, you can, you can get uh, the natural log of the, um, of the exchange current, which is important for understanding you know, how, fast the, how fast the reactions or the electrode kinetics are, um, as well as just the plot itself. Um, if you want uh, your electrode to perform well, you want it to generate a lot of a lot higher current for just a little bit more applied over potential. So if you plot it this way, you want a very shallow slope. Um, as a result, you'll be able to generate, um, if you have a shallow slope, then you'll be able to generate a lot of hydrogen with just a little bit uh, more applied over potential and a little bit uh, less energy. Um, and, but additionally, these slopes, the slopes of the line uh, contain mechanistic information. So here I have B equals, uh, 2.3 RT over the transfer coefficient times Faraday's constant. 
And through the transfer coefficient, uh, B contains information about the rate limiting step. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you saw previously, there was the uh, oxygen evolution reaction was split into four single electron transfers. And it's, it's thought that only one of those should dictate the, the overall rate. Um, so if that is true, then you can start doing some modeling. And if you wanted to, um, this is the quote unquote traditional uh, approach to modeling the Tafel slope is this quasi equilibrium assumption. So if you make a few assumptions, um, you assume that there is a single rate limiting step. You assume that the, uh, all the other reactions reach equilibrium. And uh, the surface coverage of the electrode is constant and fixed at some, you know, usually it's an extreme value like uh, zero or one. Or, um, then you will start to, uh, then you can derive this equation for um, the transfer coefficient, um, which in theory should be diagnostic of which step is rate limiting. So um, here NB is the number of electrons transferred to the electrode before the rate limiting step. Uh, nu is the number of times the rate limiting step occurs. Uh, NR is the number of electrons transferred in, uh, in the rate limiting step and beta is the symmetry factor. So all of these uh, terms are pretty much easily known uh, a priori, assuming a, a given um, reaction mechanism. So with that, you should, in theory, be able to determine uh, what the rate limiting step is just based on the Tafel slope, the slope of that plot at high over potential. Uh, the issue, though, is that, um, well, the first issue is that all three of these assumptions are kind of questionable. Uh, so no one really believes that they're, they're right, I don't think, but um, you know, they, they do make the modeling uh, substantially easier. Um, additionally, according to the paper, the um, Tafel slope it, the Tafel slope, uh, the Tafel plot usually exhibits multiple uh, Tafel slopes, uh, and this is, cannot be explained um, with, with this traditional approach. Uh, additionally, you um, run into this issue where if you have you know, multiple mechanisms or uh, multiple potential uh, rate limiting reactions, uh, according to this equation, many of those can share the same Tafel slope. So it's not actually necessarily diagnostic, even, um, even if this equation worked perfectly. And this is where the innovation of the paper starts to come in. Uh, which is we start using the steady state assumption, which uh, I talked to Tyler about this. And, you know, apparently this is applied to, you know, this has been applied to other catalysis systems and, and things like that. But this is the, to his knowledge, the first um, time that the oxygen evolution reaction has been modeled with this, with the steady state assumption instead of the quasi equilibrium assumption. So if you assume that all of the reactions reach steady state, uh, you can start to do some, uh, some better modeling. Um, so here I have the Butler-Volmer equation uh, again, except I've included the coverages. So these thetas here are the coverages, the fraction of the surface that is occupied by the reactant of interest <coughs> or the product of interest um, over the total number of surface sites. And this should lead to a you know, better uh, interpretation of the Tafel plot. The issue though, uh, is that these, these terms in red are not necessarily known uh, a priori. In fact, they're they're probably not known. It's very difficult to know what the what these numbers are. Uh, so, the workaround, at least of the one that's employed here, is to uh, use DFT. So, using DFT, you can simulate um, you can simulate these standard reaction potentials. Um, which, for the record, the intermediate reaction potentials don't necessarily occur at the um, and probably don't necessarily uh, occur at the same uh, standard reaction potential that the overall reaction occurs at. Um, so using DFT, you can start to uh, make a, a, a guesses at what these um, these potentials will be, uh, as well as start to uh, play around with the surface coverage. So that leads us to this combined thermodynamic and uh, microkinetic approach uh, that is used in this paper uh, that resolves you know several issues uh, that were present in previous modeling. Uh, so. These are the key assumptions, the key things that, that have been laid out in the paper. Uh, they wanted to calculate for forward and backward reactions for all steps. Um, this is it, from one of those reasons is that this allows us to account for cases where the back reaction is actually favored at standard potential, uh, which is not necessarily favored at um, or not, not taken into account in the quasi equilibrium approach because all the um, reactions are basically assumed to be heavily dominated by the forward reaction. Uh, but that is not necessarily true at the um, standard potential of the overall reaction. And they also don't want to make a priori assumptions about the rate limiting step, which was necessary for the quasi-equilibrium approach. 
Uh, they want their model to inform them about what the rate limiting step probably is, rather than just testing all the possible rate limiting steps and seeing which one fits the data the best. Uh, additionally, they wanted to solve for the galvanic potential at the um, electrode and electrolyte interface for uh, all of the intermediate steps. Uh, in this way, they can calculate all standard rate constants and allow for all of the intermediate reactions to play a role in the overall rate uh, of the oxygen evolution reaction. And lastly, they wanted to combine thermodynamics and kinetics uh, to account for realistic coverage conditions. Now, previously, there was an improvement to the quasi-equilibrium approach, which allowed um, them to, uh, the authors of that paper, to produce uh, these plots that did take into account a changing surface coverage. However, uh, it was purely th thermodynamic and um, due to, if there is slow kinetics uh, at one of the steps, then you expect that that will alter uh, the surface coverage. You'll expect that kinetics actually dictates, um, puts the surface of the electrode in the kinetically trapped state where it cannot um, reach its thermodynamic uh, coverage. And so they lay these out in a series of seven steps. Uh, the first is to calculate this bulk Courbet diagram, which is basically a phase diagram for the, for the electrode. Uh, this allows them to identify which, um, which phases of their electrode will be, they will simulate later for the uh, later oxygen evolution reaction simulations. Uh, they also wanted to calculate uh, a surface Courbet diagram, which gives them an idea of what kinds of uh, surface coverages they can they can expect um, expect at the potentials of interest, and with that information, they can uh, then calculate the binding strength of each of the intermediates uh, in the overall reaction, which in, which is really the point of the first four steps, so that they are able to feed that information into the kinetic model for um, the standard reaction potential. Uh, then they include a self-consistency check in step six, where they uh, see if the kinetics match uh, what's predicted by the thermodynamics before finally proceeding on to um, you know, some more intense kinetic modeling that matches the, the results of their, their, previous, uh, their previous kinetic modeling. Um, and one more uh, thing is needed to, to carry out this paper, which is um, you know, they need a system to, to do these sorts of calculations on. Um, and this one is a very good system. This is the uh, paper that uh, Tyler and friends published uh, in 2019, where they, um, <clears throat> where they did uh, a bunch of characterization, very uh, intense characterization on uh, this cobalt hydroxide catalyst. So they had a lot of data from, from this, um, from this uh, system, and which is what they used to model, uh, to carry out their model on the other uh, the other approaches. So it's both useful because it informs them more about this system, uh, as well as it demonstrates, it's pretty demonstrative of, of this overall technique, which is really the, the goal of their, um, uh, of the, of the paper, to demonstrate this, this uh, theoretical uh, modeling technique. So now we can get into the actual results. Uh, so steps, steps one through three are to um, construct these Pourbaix diagrams. Uh, so if you haven't seen one of these before, which I hadn't before uh, looking at this paper, um, you see that on the uh, y-axis you have a you have the potential, and on the x-axis you have the pH. And this is basically a phase diagram where they are able to identify what phases should exist thermodynamically um, as simulated through uh, dimensional functional or DFT calculations. Um, the ones in blue, the ones that are highlighted in blue, are the uh, compounds they chose to simulate for their um, for the paper. And the reason that uh, they did that, well, first of all, the uh, experimental pH is is over here at um, you know, roughly thirteen. Um, additionally, uh, it's at the these are the ones that occur in the relevant voltage range from roughly you know uh, zero to to two volts. And they left out this CO3O4 compound um, because it's, first of all, a very different crystal structure from the uh, other three phases, um, which means that likely it's very kinetically limited for the, for the electrode to actually transform into this phase. Uh, additionally, it's my understanding that uh, in the characterization paper, they had, uh, they had found reason to believe that this phase did not play a role uh, in, the, 
in the oxygen evolution reaction. Uh, so with this knowledge, they take those three phases that they um, have identified as of interest, and they start to simulate some coverage conditions. So they, um, this is on the y-axis, you have the, uh, the potential, and on the x-axis, you have which, um, which bulk species it corresponds to. And what they did is they took uh, a few coverage conditions. Um, they said you, you can have a monolayer of any of the, um, of any of, you know, nothing, water, uh, OH star, or O star, uh, or you can have, you know, one half monolayer of one of those species and one half monolayer of one of the other species. Uh, this uh, calculation is quite computationally intense. Um, so quite computationally demanding. And as a result, uh, they decided not to simulate uh, any sort of smooth transition between these, these monolayers, uh, thinking that a uh, half monolayer of each is you know, substantial for, or is uh, sufficient for a transition between uh, two coverage conditions. And lastly, I'll note that I'm going to include this, um, the reaction scheme at the bottom whenever I, whenever I can, because uh, I found myself flipping back and forth between uh, what the what the reaction actually was that we were considering as I was I was reading, reading this paper, so this, uh, this should be helpful to to keep everyone on the same page. Okay, and then moving on to step four, which is to calculate um, the standard potential for the intermediate reactions. So what they did is they take these surface coverages, these possible surface coverages, and they try to simulate the uh, the binding energy for species that are going to absorb onto uh, the surface of the of the electrodes. So they they keep a single coverage condition except for one site. So the rest of the sites are occupied by uh, one of their assumed coverages, and then they, given one site, they uh, you know bind a species to it and see what the energy of that interaction is. Uh, and this way, they can come up with. Um, what the binding energy is for each of these species in the presence of um, their numerous coverage conditions. With that information, that actually allows them to uh, adjust the standard reaction potential to, uh, to, fit, to find the intermediate reaction potentials. And so you'll see in the black line uh, here, you have the reaction coordinate diagram for zero volts, uh, red is for uh, 1.23 volts, which is the standard potential of the overall reaction. And the blue is the potential at the potential limiting step. Uh, now this merits some explanation. Uh, it confused me at least uh, when I first read that, but if you notice the, um, if you take a look at the red curve, uh, the barrier between the OH star and the O star step, which is uh, this step, the second step down here, uh, is the highest. And if they want to take the diagram down to a situation where all of the steps are spontaneous. Uh, and by that, I mean the, each intermediate is downhill of the neck of the previous intermediate. They have to drop the potential down to this, this 1.9 in this volts in this, uh, in this situation. Uh, as you can see, this blue line here is a long plateau instead of uh, you know, two, two steps. So they reduce these to, to being the same energy. So taking this, uh, this knowledge of the standard potential of each of these reactions, you can then um, start to simulate the kinetics. This is where the steady state approach starts to come in again. So in the, um, on the left, I have the uh, net reaction rates for each of the, uh, each of the reactions. And keeping in mind that uh, we're using the Butler-Volmer framework for, uh, for these rate constants. Uh, and you'll notice that in those, in those rate constants are the terms for the, um, for the standard reaction potential, which is again, obtained through DFT. <coughs> uh, they can then invoke the steady state assumption, which is that the coverage of each of these uh, species is not changing uh, as a function of time, uh, which means that the second reaction rate minus the first reaction rate, uh, the third reaction rate minus the second reaction rate, and the fourth reaction rate minus the third reaction rate, all of those should sum to, to zero. And here are the results. 
Uh, so you can see that the fit is you know, pretty good for, for all of these situations. Uh, this is only a selection of their, their fit. Um, this is only for the uh, beta cobalt oxyhydroxide phase uh, rather than these two other phases. And beneath uh, the title for each of the phases, you'll see the uh, monolayer coverage, the coverage that was assumed during the DFT part of the process. This is where I think you really start to see the, the beauty of this approach. Um, but uh, before I get into that, they did actually simulate the quasi-equilibrium uh, approach for, for doing these kinds of fits as well. Um, the, now this is, again, is only a small subset of, of their overall fits. Uh, they had to fit, you know, pick each rate limiting step, then pair it with each um, you know, potential monolayer coverage and pair that with each potential bulk phase. So there's a series of like, you know, 20 or 30 of these fits. So I just picked the ones that um, that matched up best to to these um, to these species at the top in these model layer coverages. Uh, but you can see that in two of these reactions, uh, there is no change in Tafel slope. So straight line does not fit this data particularly well. Uh, and in the third, when you do see a change in slope, um, it's pretty unphysical. So this really highlights the shortcomings of the of this quasi equilibrium, this this traditional approach. Um, Rather than over the, the steady state approach, uh, which is you know much better, does a much better job of fitting this this data. Uh, but moving on to um, you know further uh, to finding the actual rate limiting step. Uh, so once they have simulated this, once they fit this, they have the rate constants for each and every one of their intermediate reactions. Uh, which can then be converted to a uh, activation energy. So you'll notice that uh, this is the this is the Iring equation. This um, term on the left is the standard rate constant for a reaction, and this delta G up here is the uh, activation energy. So once you have the activation energy, uh, it becomes pretty straightforward to try to simulate to uh, draw up the full reaction coordinate diagram. So again, um, these red lines are at the standard reaction potential. The blue lines are at um, the potential limiting uh, potential. And the black line is at zero volts. And you can see that there's um, you know, a plateau for each kinetic barrier as well as a, um, a final you know, end state for, for each reaction. And this is just uh, to demonstrate that it's <clears throat> a little easier to pick out what the rate limiting step is in each of these situations. It's the one with the highest uh, kinetic barrier. So they go through, they pick these rate limiting steps. And um, I found this particularly elegant is they then check for consistency. What I mean by that is that if you have a, you know, based on these three plots at the top, you know, all of those do a pretty decent job of predicting, you know, the overall behavior. The way you start to rule some of them out as possibilities is you start to check whether that's actually, whether the DFT is consistent with the, kinetics. So if the second step is slow, for example, then you would expect the second steps reactant to start to build up on the surface. You expect a, a high concentration of that reactant. And you'll see that uh, you know, in, this, in this first one, for example, um, H2O is not really a, uh, it's not H2O stars nor um, you know, an empty surface site. Neither of those are reactants for the selected rate limiting step, which is, which is O star. Uh, so as a result, uh, you can't say that this is particularly likely to occur because you would expect the reactants for this step to be in high concentration, not uh, not these empty surface sites occupied by, by H2O. And it turns out that the only one up here that is self-consistent um, is the second one, which does show that there is considerable, the DFT calculation was done with considerable um, OH star concentration. And you expect high OH star uh, concentration given the rate limiting step. So in this uh, interplay between the two, uh, you know, the kinetics and the thermodynamics, they are able to uh, start to rule out some of these possibilities. And as it turns out, <clears throat> for each of the phases, uh, there is only one that seemed to be self-consistent. Uh, so those are outlined in bold here. And so these, this is the results of, of this, uh, this fit. 
Now, aside from noting that um, each of the uh, phases only seems to have one rate limiting step, you can start to take a look at the errors. But you'll notice that a large portion of the errors are quite high. Um, and this, these are 95% confidence intervals. And frequently, the error in these uh, rate constants is, is higher than the, the rate constant itself. Uh, so this means a few things. First, that our lack of confidence in each of these rate constants means that you know, we don't have uh, particularly, that, doesn't, that rate constant doesn't really affect the fit all that much, uh, which means it doesn't really affect the overall reaction all that much. So using this logic, you can say that, well, it does seem that one rate limiting step can be sufficient to, to model the, the overall reaction. Um, and the second thing, which I don't believe is, is listed here, but um, they noted that there's a large covariance between each of these uh, reaction rates. What that suggests is that these errors are all kind of compensating for, for something similar. There's some underlying uh, mistake in the, in the method that is leading to these rate constants to kind of vary together. And they list a few of these options. Uh, one of those is that you know, perhaps the DFT simulation for, um, for the equilibrium potential uh, is not very accurate because we are, um, we didn't, the solvent wasn't taken into account. Uh, but the more likely a uh, candidate is that there is a phase change in the uh, bulk reaction in the bulk electrode. Uh, so this was not accounted for first, uh, but now the bulk poor bay diagram that was the first diagram that was in the paper uh, starts to become uh, more and more useful. So they start to simulate this phase change and rather than include it as another kinetic process, uh, they decide that you know it, it is okay to instead assume that that reaction is, is um, equilibrium, they use a solidus solution uh, approximation. And this should be okay, um, as really we don't really care about how the bulk electrode changes, we just care about the, the very surface of the electrode. Uh, so that, in my mind, should be quite fast. So you can start to assume that that part at least uh, reaches equilibrium, which will lead to this um, diagram that is, um, or should be familiar to, to those of us who are familiar with the Nernst equation. Uh, because it is just a solid, it is just a solid solution uh, approximation. And then they add a few more uh, little pieces of complexity to their, their model. Um, the first thing, uh, the, in addition to fitting this phase change parameter, uh, the standard potential for the phase change, they also decide to fit the symmetry factor. So previously, um, this was just assumed to be 0.5. And there is good reason to think that it should just be uh, 0.5. Uh, that's in line with several uh, other kinetic uh, kinetic models, uh, but you know, if it's there, we might as well fit it, um, gain more confidence in our data, uh, as uh, gain more confidence in our data. And then to accommodate this increased complexity, you know, you've added two more parameters to an already very parameter heavy model. Um, use they had they decided to uh, take away uh, three of the rate constants. So we've identified the rate limiting step already. We've identified uh, via the high variance in the other rate constants that there is really, you know, it can be considered to have just one rate limiting step. So to accommodate this increase in complexity, they just set the other three uh, rate constants to have zero activation barrier. So there's only kinetic barrier uh, between the reactants and products. Sorry, there's only a thermodynamic barrier between the reactants and products, no kinetic barrier. That brings us to our seventh and final step, which is, um, you know, they, they, they carry that out. Uh, so here, in addition to the coverage and the current versus potential plots, um, you'll see, you can see that they're, they've accounted for these phase changes um, in their diagrams. And, you know, they all give like an okay fit. So how do we start to uh, figure out which of these uh, scenarios is, is, um, is most representative of physical reality? Uh, one of these questions is, you know, which of these uh, catalyst species is active? <clears throat> uh, so they 
rule out this first one because it just doesn't quite fit the data. Um, you see at high uh, potentials, the current starts to drop, which is just not what is seen. It's, it's not, um, not a physical representation of, of what's going on. So you, um, so they rule that out uh, and they assume that uh, cobalt hydroxide is not, is not active. But these other two are, are quite plausible. They both give very good fits. Um, and there's no real reason to think they're both self-consistent. Uh, there's no real reason to think that either of those will be um, inaccurate. Uh, so unfortunately, this is the limit of this, this model, um, which in order to distinguish which of these species is active and uh, which of these um, uh, which of these most represents physical reality, uh, we will require further characterization. And I must have talked uh, very quickly because that actually brings me to my closing remarks. Uh, it took me 45 minutes to get through this this morning, but <clears throat> um, this is the, I just wanted to make a few uh, closing remarks to this, this method. Um, First of all, I think this, and I'm not just saying this because Tyler may or may not be in the audience, I think this is a, a widely applicable model. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very uh, impressed by the elegance of the, the approach. Uh, this should be applicable for um, any series of uh, electrochemical reactions, not just limited to electric catalysis. Uh, I could even see something like this being used in my own work to, to figure out um, kinetics of, of SEI with a little bit of you know, modification. Uh, but more than that, um, I think the philosophy in the in that's embedded in the approach is, is quite um, quite powerful. Uh, so they the first thing that they did that I thought was um, really great was they combined these thermodynamic and steady state concepts and included a, a check for self consistency uh, between the two um, in, in order to you know bridge the shortcomings of, of each method. Uh, so I think that's. Um, that, that's something that I think can be uh, you know, applied in, in many other situations. Uh, as well as uh, they did this process where they start with you know, the very basics, they just start drawing some phase diagrams, picking out um, you know, what things are possible, and then they, um, they start simulating. At no point do they assume that the reaction actually reaches equilibrium, at least not until, uh, not until the phase change. Uh, instead, they just use the thermodynamics to inform what is possible, which is really what thermodynamics tells us. And then they um, they build everything. Um, they build to the kinetic model from there. Um, so I, I think that's uh, that's something that's going to that could yield success in many fields. This kind of um, interplay or the, uh, this kind of um, slow building towards towards uh, thermodynamic properties of interest. Um, so yeah, that's that's why I'll label this a must read. I, I found it very helpful, even though it doesn't. Uh, doesn't relate directly to my research. And before I end, just wanted to thank uh, Emily and Tyler because they both spent a couple hours with me talking about uh, explaining this paper to me uh, because I did not understand it at first. Um, and I don't know that I understand, I don't know how much I understand it now, but it's a lot better uh, due to these two. Um, and a few more wedding pictures if you're interested. That's it. Beautiful. Um... First, congratulations on your wedding. Um, thank you. This is, these are very beautiful pictures. Um, and then thank you for, you know, presenting it a beautiful work in a beautiful way. Um, I think uh, for, for me, I think I need to read it again. Some, some, some of them are a little bit complicated, but- um, it, it's, the, Yeah, it's this, quite complex. Um, yeah. I, I did a very good job. I meant to go through that much slower than I, I guess I did. <laughs> you did a very good job, yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Or any congrats, congratulations to Justin for his wedding, <laughs> either. Oh, geez. Congrats. Thanks, Emma. Yeah, Justin. Thanks, Grace. Congrats. Thanks, Avi. <laughs> um, I, I have a somewhat general question, I guess. Um, so the level of detail um, that you're able to go through in these systems um, is amazing. And it it very it it rarely like it very it's in very big contrast to what we see in the lithium ion battery literature, where we we don't really have like a good idea of what the possible reactions um, are involved. So, what would be like the 
things we would have to know to get there, like to apply these type of more sophisticated methods to lithium ion battery systems? Yeah, so this, this is a, a bit outside my comfort zone, but in my mind, the, the big difference between a catalysis and lithium ion batteries from the start is that um, you know, the electron transfer is a little simpler. Um, it's just a single electron transfer from, from lithium to, to, the, uh, to you know, the cathode or, or whatever it is you're working with. Um, that said, I believe that there are a number of um, you know, phase rearrangement processes and things like that. So I, I could see this, um, this, particularly in cathodes, you could see um, you, you including the transition metal migration and, and things like that in, in this sort of, uh, sort of a framework. Um, so I, I think in that sense, we do know what we would need to know. I would think that you um, you understand. Okay, the transition like these are the kinds of structural changes that can happen. Um, hopefully, you can limit it to three or four, and, and then you can. I think you can start simulating the the DFT. Um, I hope that answers your question. If you have something, if you have like a more specific application in mind, maybe I can um, weigh in. Um. I, I I don't I don't really know. I was just curious. Um, if there's a particular reason why we can't look into lithium-ion battery systems with more detail. Um, I think a lot of it is a philosophical difference. Um, I, I think we can look at them this way. It's basically what I what I'm thinking after reading this paper. Um, people just don't because it's not like. You know, I'm kind of on board with Tyler now that we don't really do real electrochemistry in batteries, um, but I don't see a reason we can't um, do this this sort of a, a modeling approach. Um, so I'm just I just kind of get the feeling that some of this is possible; it just hasn't been done. Uh, but I, you know, I'd have to look at specific applications. It's, yeah, hand it's, uh, raised, Tyler. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, I have a couple of comments. One, okay. I think you do real electrochemistry with the batteries. Okay. Oh, think. sorry. <laughs> sorry for putting words in your mouth. Great uh, job on the presentation. I think right. for applications to lithium ion batteries, there's two, I mean, two big applications of this approach that our group does that we could use it for. One would be to study the SEI. And of course, the SEI has many possible products. And some of this, you know, if you could use, if you could understand the rate and mechanism of the SEI formation, you could, in theory, direct towards certain preferential products. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad and, you, uh, you agree with that, because that was the application that jumped out. To, yeah, I mean, but what, what do you need to know for that uh, to do this type of analysis? It's actually a little similar to what we need to know for the OER, and we we still don't know. So you, you put one mechanistic scheme up, which is the general scheme that the DFT people use. Um, and all of those intermediates are known. So we know we can make a hydroxyl group at the surface or an oxide mm. or a hydroperoxide. But that doesn't mean that that's actually how the, how the OER proceeds. Those are just intermediates that we have observed. Uh, and there are many other intermediates that people have proposed, like superoxide, other things. So for the SEI, what you would want to know first is what are some of the intermediates? And usually, actually, I think a good uh, a good analogous work to SEI to try to figure out what intermediates are possible is to look at the DFT work on CO2 reduction, where there are many possible outcomes and many different multi-carbon containing species. And you can just, I mean, you can do DFT of possibilities and see what the relative energies are. So you need to know what can happen on the surface. That's key to doing any of the DFT. Then the second application that I think it would be useful for is understanding the rate of oxygen gas formation for the uh, lithium excess cathodes and how you can basically interpret the electrochemical results in terms of the rate of uh, maybe oxygen gas generation and structural uh, rearrangement of the cathodes. And then you can use, I mean, if you understand the rates of those processes and how they occur, 
And you, similarly, you can develop design principles for the cathodes to slow down uh, processes that you that aren't favorable, basically. Yeah. That one actually is a little bit easier because most of the structural rearrangement and oxygen gas generation can be modeled as occurring like in the bulk of the crystal. So there's only a few possibilities of what can actually happen. Yeah, that's a good point is the knowing the intermediates is really the, the key. Uh, maybe a follow-up question for Tyler's comment on the ACI. I agree that the ACI is a, a more complicated than the uh, oxygen evolution. So for an ACI, when you have you know coupled reactions with multiple you know um, reaction mechanism, multiple products, multiple interspecies, um, what would we be your thought in terms of like um, decoupling those you know reactions to to apply this kind of model? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's a the more the more possible outcomes and the more possible reactions that can occur, the more complicated the model gets, and eventually it may get so complicated you can't get uh, explicit solutions to do the modeling. You have to do kind of numerical solutions. Uh, but I mean, all you really need to do is just. I mean, it's a little bit straightforward if you know that the outcome, the final product, if you can count how many new bonds are formed basically. Mm -hmm. And for every new bond that's formed, you assume that that's at least one step to get to that bond. Um, and I mean, you just make the assumption that, I mean, at, at the most basic level, every electron and every atom that's added to the reactant has its own individual reaction. So if you added a proton and an electron, that should happen in two steps. Unless it, that's a little bit different because protons can be transferred concertedly with electrons, but let's say lithium atom, a lithium ion and an electron being added to an EC molecule, that should happen in two steps. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can kind of just build up a basic mechanism and test mm -hmm. some of the stabilities of intermediates relative to each other. And usually the more stable the intermediate is, the more it's preferred as a, as a, as an intermediate. Makes sense. So to jump in, because I can't raise my hand as the host, cause I'm just curious about this. I think a lot of this reaction pathway work has been done in SEI in a way that would make this technique very, very interesting but it's really challenging to form these TOEFL curves because the SEI is self-passivating. So as you move to more reducing potentials on the SEI, you end up actually impeding your own relationships. You don't get the nice curves. Is there a good way to work around that? Yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, okay, so in all of, so the TAFL analysis and developing the TAFL curve, basically you have to start with your raw experimental data and work backwards until you are at a point where you've removed all of the other influential variables outside of just the reaction rate. So if you were doing something like uh, oxygen reduction, for example, where there's a big mass transfer limitation, you have to correct your data for that mass transfer and get it to basically pure kinetic data. If you have the SEI formation, you have to have some model that uh, describes the increased resistivity from the formation of the passivation layer. And basically as a function of time so that you can correct your data to remove that influence. I was wondering I mean, it if makes you, it more difficult. Go ahead, sorry. I was wondering if you could um, do this sort of a thing on, on an RDE or something like that, um, where you just scan very quickly. So you can assume that the increase in, in resistance is negligible. I'm not sure if that's, um, that's something that would, that would work or not. Can I chime in really quickly? Of course. Um, actually, so I, I, I'm, my thoughts are a little bit different than Tyler's. I think SCI, of course, is great to study, but I don't think that's where I would start first. Um, I would think because um, lithium intercalation is a one electron process, in principle, it should be very easy to understand. 
so it's a little bit surprising that we don't really understand it. I mean, um, Justin, you just presented a four electron process, mm -hmm. right? It's substantially more complex. So my actually thinking was, we should first just try to understand a simple intercalation reaction, one electron, um, concerted uh, lithiation and electron transfer. And there I would sort of take the topo equation and, and just try to understand all aspects of it. So I think there are three contributions, right? One is the field dependence. So we don't really know exactly what is the expression on potential, right? So current density versus potential, even with all the concentrations fixed, that is not well understood. And people will tell you experimentally, they have measured it. I would very much dispute that. Um, even my own colleagues measuring these, I think half of the time they're wrong because there's so many interfaces in a, in a battery electrode, you don't really know where you're measuring. I think Steven knows what I'm talking about. You know, if you have a electron transfer limitation at the current collector, then you're measuring that instead. So I think that's the first contribution is we really have to understand what is the top of slope, right? The electric potential term only. And then the two other terms are the concentration terms. One of them is the concentration in the intercalation material. So this would be the concentration of lithium. So this is also very difficult to understand as well. And then finally, the one that sort of never study is the concentration in the electrolyte, your salt concentration term. So Peter Atia has done some work here to look at the reaction order. So I would argue at the end of the day, these three contribution, the two concentration terms and the field term, once you can measure them and then model them, then we can say something about this concerted um, lithiation electron transfer. So this is, I think really, I would say low hanging fruit, but it's hard to do. Um, it's just waiting for someone to do it. Um, so I think it's a ripe area for some very fundamental work that would be, I think, illuminating, it wouldn't be that interesting, but someone has to do it. And then we can move on to the more complex reactions, I think, involving SEM. So that's my, my two cents. Anybody sort of looking for interesting ideas to look at, this could be one. Yeah, I also would add to that, Will, I think that the nice part of doing a lithiation reaction or one electron reaction is, so in the, in the work that you presented, Justin, and in this paper, you know, we use the Butler-Volmer equation, which we know is not correct, right? We, it's a nice phenomenological description of just empirical observations, but it's not based on any like first principles physics of how the reaction should occur. And there is additional uh, complexity added for the oxygen evolution reaction and a lot of electrocatalytic reactions because you have chemisorb species, you have bonds formed with reactive intermediates. And for a single electron process, you can try to understand a little bit more about the kind of solvent reorganization energy. Uh, so like what is desolvation of lithium from the electrolyte as a step of lith lithiation, how that influences reaction rates uh, without having to think about, oh, the lithium ion forms a chemical bond with whatever the kind of electron transfer site is of the cathode material. Right, I think um, maybe that would be good for the questions for today. Um, thank you everyone for your questions and participations. Um, before we go out for breakout,